Um, now I'd like to bring up our Curator of Education, Jim D. Pompey. I have the distinct honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, and I'm going to read the bio, because as a former professor of mine, I don't want to go back and dock my GPA in case you get into the Our guest speaker this evening is a professor of biological sciences and anthropology at USC. He has conducted extensive field research on wild great apes, monkeys, and reptiles. His work is often focused on the ecological relationships among the primate species, sharing a tropical forest ecosystem. He has conducted field studies in East Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Central and South America. In addition to over 20 years field research on chimpanzee behavior, the ecology in East Africa, he has collaborated in studies on mountain gorillas, endangered Asian primates, and other animals as well. He is the author or co-author of over 16 books and more than 150 scholarly papers. He holds a research appointment in vertebrate biology at the Los Angeles County Museum of Natural History and is involved in biology and conservation of endangered tortoises in Southeast Asia. His research has been profiled in numerous national newspapers, and he's a frequent guest on television and radio programs about human origins, animal behavior, and is published widely in popular and scholarly literature. So without further ado, I would love to introduce our tonight's speaker, Dr. Craig Stanford. That was nice. Okay. Thank you very much, Jim. That, that was a 4.0 introduction. <laughs> and I think that either you or my mom wrote that introduction. It was really, it's really nice. All right, thank you very much. Thanks to the Aquarium. Thanks to Chicken of the Sea. Thanks to Julie, who organized this talk series and invited me. And I've talked, I think it, I just said earlier, I think every major venue in LA area, having been at USC for 20 some years, except this one, I've been here for events as you are, but I've never been a speaker. So it's honestly a delight to be here. Okay, so you might be wondering at this point, why is somebody who studies chimpanzees and has lived in Africa for a big chunk of his life speaking at an aquarium? And the answer to that is, will become obvious, I think. But let me just say about myself that uh, I have spent decades now studying the behavior of the great apes and other primates, but in particular this guy up here, the chimpanzee. But at one point in my career, um, I became also interested and involved in uh, marine biology. And ironically, I was a marine biology undergraduate back east many, many years ago. So I met a colleague of mine who some of you I think know, Dr. Madalena Bayarzi, who was at the time just graduated her PhD from UCLA. And she's a dolphin biologist studying the dolphins of Santa Monica Bay. So we got together and wrote a couple of uh, scholarly papers, the kind that 50 people in the world, no, 30 people in the world will ever actually read. <laughs> And then she suggested we write a book. So we wrote a little book together, which we, which we gave the cute title, Beautiful Minds, which is about these two animals that seem to have just about nothing in common, except that they're mammals, chimpanzees, or great apes in general, and dolphins, or the, the tooth whales and dolphins in general. And we wrote a book about the really amazing parallels between them, and especially what those parallels might tell us about ourselves, and the origins of intelligence on Earth, given that these are the two, these represent the two most big-brained, intelligent lineages of animals on Earth. So my talk tonight is going to be very much about that. And as I said, and as Jim just said in the introduction, I've done, a work, I've done work on a lot of different animals. Actually, in recent years, I've been doing a lot of work on reptiles and tur turtles and tortoises in particular. But tonight, my topic is going to be uh, really about chimps and dolphins and the parallels between them. All right, so when biologists talk about parallels between animals, we get technical about it, but a very simple way to think of this is the following. These two snakes, one of which actually um, was uh, my pet for many, many years in my office over here, um, are, are absolutely unrelated. Okay, yeah, they're both snakes but they have not had a common ancestor for more than 10 million years. And the fact that a casual observer, I mean, unless you're really super into snakes, you're gonna look at these two photos and you're gonna assume they are the same animal, the same species, when in fact, they are not. So everything from the color pattern, the green with the white blotches, to the vertical pupils of the eye, to the shape of the head, uh, to the fact that they're lying as they're lying, coiled over their branches or their perches there, all of that is due not to shared ancestry, 
but to what we call parallel or convergent evolution. They evolved in completely opposite sides of the world, New Guinea and Australia for the green tree python, and South America, the Amazon basin for the emerald tree boa, to, to occupy similar roles, similar niches, sitting on trees in a canopy of rainforest, waiting for rodents to walk by that they would strike at and ambush and eat for their dinner. And the process of evolution took them on these similar paths, again, not because of their shared genetics, that just made them both snakes, but all of the other details of what they look like are due to convergence. So this is a process that happens. We know it happens. We see it all the time. If you went to Australia, you'd find an animal that we call a mouse, in, in air quotes, it's not really a mouse at all. A mouse refers to this little rodent uh, and all of its relatives that exist by the billions over most of the world, and we can call it a placental mouse, meaning it reproduces the same way that we do with a placenta and an umbilicus and so forth. In Australia, you have all those marsupial animals, right? We have one marsupial here. What's our marsupial in LA? The possum, right? But there are marsupials um, all over Australia and parts of New Guinea and some other areas as well. They are not mice, but they look just like mice. If I showed you one, you'd really have to find some biologist to dissect it to figure out that it actually is not truly a mouse. Again, convergent evolution. So we all relate to this concept because we watch science fiction. And if you watch, if you watch science fiction, at least until recently when everything could be CGI created in wonderful and very innovative ways, we went back to you know, partly people in costumes, but also there's always this idea that alien life extraterrestrials would be sort of, kind of, somehow like us for no really good reason, right? But in fact, most biologists who think about this stuff, uh, it's a whole other lecture that we won't do, think that actually the, the, the finite possibilities of living on Earth, uh, on an Earth-like planet, might lead to something that looked roughly sort of human-ish in terms of how it moved around and how it, how it operated in general. Again, that's just called parallel or conversion evolution, if such a creature actually existed. All right, so to get specific about our lecture tonight, these, this list of traits is what I'll be talking about. If we compared cetaceans, meaning oh, dolphins and whales, but more particularly for our purposes tonight, let's, let's think about dolphins and the great apes, especially chimpanzees, we have this suite of five traits in common. They both have big brains. They both live in very complicated, fluid societies, which we give the label uh, fission fusion to. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. It took Jane Goodall uh, 17 years to figure out, from 1960 when she began her work, to the late 70s, to figure out that chimpanzees did not live in a totally formless, amorphous, promiscuous society, which is what it looks like when you just watch them kind of casually for a few months or a few weeks. They actually have a structure, and that structure is a complicated one that we call fission fusion. I'll come back to that. And dolphins, bottlenose dolphins in particular, live in something very, very similar. Um, learn cultural traditions and sophisticated communication. Well, we know all, you know, if you know anything about dolphins, you know that they are quite sophisticated in the way they communicate, and you know that there are traditions. You may not be aware of some of those cultural traditions, but I'll talk about them tonight. And chimpanzees are truly a cultural animal. When Goodall began making her discoveries in the early 60s, it genuinely revolutionized our view of not just them, but our view of ourselves. Uh, male alliances will come back to also. Male alliances which do a lot of nasty stuff. So, you know, dolphins have that, that frozen smile that some of us who grew up in the flipper generation of, of TV <laughs> thought of them as being kind, gentle, fuzzy, warm animals, and they sometimes are, but they often are not. Same applies to chimpanzees, especially the males. And finally, coordinated hunting behavior, and we'll come back to that as well. So they have this suite of characteristics, even though they don't have a shared ancestor for a hundred million years of Earth's history. Now, there are other animals on Earth that have some of these, but there's no other group of animals that has the whole suite in common as these guys do. That's really, really interesting. We take an animal that looks sort of like us, a chimpanzee, very much like us. We take another animal that looks more like a torpedo or a cruise missile or something, a dolphin, and yet they have this convergence. How in the world did that happen and what does it mean? All right, before we get into that, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna spend the next part of the talk talking about my own work with chimpanzees over many years, telling you a bit more than you might know already about what chimpanzees are all about, 
I have a new book that came out that was on one of those slides, The New Chimpanzee. It's about the last 20 years of discoveries about chimpanzee life, chimpanzee behavior, and I'll, I'll kind of highlight some of those. And then I'll segue into talking about dolphins and give you some comparisons. Before we do that, in order to begin, let's look at our family tree. So, <laughs> so, all right, so this is a serious topic, okay? And I don't, know, I don't know what you find so amusing, but this is our family tree as we understand it in 2018. I think most of you are familiar with this. Let me just point out a couple of things. This point right here, I didn't put numbers on this, um, this evolutionary tree, but that point right there that I pointed to represents about six million years ago when that divergence happened, a fork in the road, and the evolutionary road happened, leading to humans and all of our ancestors. So if you looked at this arrow on the right leading to him, it begins with the earliest hominins, uh, Lucy, if you know who Lucy was, Australopithecines, all the way up through Homo erectus, Neanderthals, and so forth. The other side leads to modern day chimpanzees and bonobos. In other words, we have two sister species on Earth today, chimps and bonobos. We're all equal, equally related to one another, and they, they, they and we share a common ancestor six million years ago. And then I want to point out also that further back, we have gorillas and orangutans. You all know about those guys. But just to say that today, we recognize two species of gorilla, western lowland and eastern mountain. And we also recognize, only as of about a year ago, three orangutan species. There's one on Sumatra, there's one on Borneo, those are two large islands in Indonesia, and as of a year ago we have another species also on Sumatra in a little valley where 500 orangutans have been separated as another species. So three species, uh, obviously critically endangered from the moment that they were labeled a new species. So that's our family tree. Um, genetically, we and chimpanzees are extremely similar. There's this number that you might have heard thrown around, the media uses it all the time, that we're 98.8 or sometimes 98.4% identical in our DNA sequence. That's a very misleading number. It's actually, the number actually means that it, that's the average figure of something like 50 or 60 different studies of, that have been done that compared our two genomes and they just took an average figure. Um, the number is a little bit misleading and not very important because if you compared our genome to that of a mouse, it's 80-something percent similar because we simply have a lot of redundancy in our DNA sequence. What's probably more important to say is first that even though our genomes are, are very, very similar, the genome is so huge, three billion bases long, that even a 98.8 percent identical uh, overlap still means that we're really super different, 35 million differences. It also is true that um, the differences that are important are the functional differences. So why do chimps have body hair and we don't? Why do we have language and chimps have some very more rudimentary form of language? Those are the key differences. We, don't, we haven't gotten at those yet. Those differences, if they're completely genetic, are like located somewhere on that sequence and we haven't found those yet. All we have is a very rough map. Okay, so you all know who this is on the left. How many of you have seen the new documentary called Jane? Has anybody seen that? Yeah, it's a wonderful documentary. I think it's not on Netflix yet, but I'm sure it will be. <clears throat> it's a bunch of found footage that was in National Geographic's basement. They gave the footage to a prominent documentary film director, Brett Morgan. He edited it down to a very beautiful documentary of the early days of Jane's research in Africa, uh, as in the upper left. But Jane, of course, today, who is 84, is still going strong. She's carrying her message around the world. She's a little bit of a Mother Teresa for the environment, and we all enormously admire her for that, of course. But I'd like to point out that um, there are many others in the world who are also doing important work. The man on the lower right passed away recently. His name is Toshisada Nishida, Japanese scientist, who is very much the, the East Asian counterpart of Jane Goodall. Not many people here would know who he is. Very few people outside of Japan knew who he was. He was never a media star. He was never a cover girl on the front of National Geographic. Uh, his English was never particularly fluent, but his work was equally important. He began five years after Jane doing a project on chimpanzees only less than 100 miles away from Jane's project. And then the Japanese built this project into a still going strong, important project that now, whereas Gombe, Jane's site in Tanzania, is approaching its 60th year, his project is approaching its 55th year. So now we have those two projects. His project is in the Mahali Mountains, 
Hers is in Gombe, both Tanzania. We have seven other long-term projects as well, and those all represent 20 or more years of research. So we know a lot. But I will say now that sometimes people say to me, yeah, we know so much. Why, why do we need to keep giving money to you guys to do research? Why does the government need to fund more chimp studies when we have all the you know, hundreds of thousands of hours of observation? And the answer is pretty simple. If you had an intergalactic explorer come to Earth and try to understand the human species and they settled into like Glendale and lived with a community or a family for 30 or 40 years, how much could they truly say about the whole of humanity and what we're all about? Right, the cultural context, not to mention genetic differences. They couldn't say too, too much. And that's really where we still are with chimpanzees. And the studies reveal new uh, breakthrough findings pretty much every year. I want to consider chimpanzees in, in this way. Um, at, first of all, as a male and a female that have two very different agendas in life. Sometimes the agendas of males and females of any species are so different that they almost operate as if they were two different species. So we have females and all of the mothering behavior that they do. Jane was really the person who first documented this. It doesn't sound revolutionary today to say that the relationship between a mom chimp and her baby is very much like the relationship between a human mom and her baby. But in 1960, that was a big deal to say. And in fact, the early reviewers of Jane's scientific papers didn't want her to, to go on about that. They thought it was anthropomorphic. They didn't want her to use names like this is Fifi, and you may know that name. She's the daughter of Flo, who was one of the famous chimps in the 60s that Jane first studied. Reviewers who were scientists working with like lab rats said, we, we, don't, we don't name our lab rats Larry and Walter and Mary. We give them code names, so you should do the same for chimps. And Jane said, no, you're missing the point entirely. The point is these animals have individual personas that matter in their lives, that dictate the course of their lives. And that's why we call them, we, we name them and we consider them individuals. And today we all accept that and embrace that. There aren't any skeptics about that. And then on the lower right, you have the males who have their own separate agenda. The, the bottom line goal of both sexes, of course, is the same. It's reproductive success. It's, it's, it's mothering or fathering babies that grow up successfully. But the way they achieve those goals, very, very different. And I also will point out in passing, these are two males at Gombe who are very close friends. And you can see how different they look. So chimps have this amazing diversity, even in the same gene pool with, you know, here's a guy on the right who's kind of a cannonball body and a, red, a ruddy freckled face. And the guy on the left was kind of lean and very dark face. So there's a lot of variation. And when you're a researcher, it, it just is, it's like that. You learn chimps' identities no, it, no, with no more difficulty than you would learn the identities of, of 50 people you were living with after, you know, within a few hours or a few days. Okay, so. The life of a female chimpanzee, and then we'll consider males, the life of a female chimpanzee looks something like this. And it's startlingly like a human lifespan in most respects. First of all, born after an eight and a half month pregnancy, right? so very much like ours. Then years of physical dependence on the mom, meaning they're nursing, they're drinking milk. If the mom should die, the baby will certainly die. Adoption has been recorded in chimpanzees very, very, very rarely, a handful of times in, in literally now hundreds of chimp years of observation. But then, importantly, after a weaning, after the mom's no longer willing to, to nurse the baby, the, the baby who's now a juvenile still has years of being psychologically dependent on the mom. And if the mom dies at that point, the baby may still not survive, even though it can feed on its own and, and travel on its own, because of this sort of an orphan effect that there's a psychological trauma that's happened. No one is going to take that uh, juvenile under his or her wing. And so really, uh, an offspring of a chimpanzee mom is dependent in some way for may maybe a decade or close to a decade on the mom. So they lead these very long, slow lives, very much as we do. Then puberty, which happens at roughly the same age in a female chimp growing up as it would in, a, in one of our own girls in our own species. First baby happens in the mid-teenage years, most typically, and then uh, birth about every five years uh, until death. And death in the wild comes by about age 40 or, or less. Uh, in captivity, where there, you, know, you don't have any disease or predators to worry about, chimpanzees routinely live to be 60 or into their early 60s. And as I note there, there's no such thing as menopause, so it's interesting that in our own species, um, 
our, our, our body systems, you know, brain, body, whatever, heart circulatory, they all age at sort of more or less the same rate, except that the female reproductive system doesn't, right? Because it, by menopause, the cycling ends by age 50 or so, but then lifespan continues for decades more potentially. And in chimpanzees, even though they don't overall live as long as we do, females have been known to give birth into their 60s, so they don't experience. The decline in fertility happens, but it happens in kind of a subtle way. So that's interesting because they really are biologically kind of very different than humans are in some ways. The mother-infant bond, I said, is long-lasting. It begins with a mom carrying her baby around, clinging to her. The one big difference between a newborn chimp and a newborn human, they're very much alike, is that the newborn chimp already has the motor skills to grab the mom's hair and cling, and cling even when she's leaping or climbing or whatever, and they can do that within hours of being born. And then later they shift over and ride on the mom's back. And this continues for years and years and years. Um, so a female chimpanzee reproductively looks like this from the, from the back. Female chimpanzees, beginning when they're about 11 or so, begin to cycle and ovulate, and uh, they have a different length cycle than we do, so instead of 28 days, it's more like 35 days. But importantly, for about 9 or 10 days in the middle of the cycle, there's this big, to us, very unattractive, to male chimpanzees, exactly the opposite, <laughs> uh, fluid-filled, pink swelling, we call it a sexual swelling, and female chimpanzees mostly don't really want to be around males. Males are a hassle, they're a, they're, they're a genuine threat because they can be aggressive to her or her baby. She really wants to be alone, traveling through the forest, looking for food. And the only time that changes is when she is cycling, so when she's not pregnant or lactating and she's, she's fertile and she's cycling and then she becomes during those nine or ten days very, very sociable. She looks for males, the males look for her, they travel the forest together. Chimpanzees, I said, they live in this society called Fission Fusion. There's no stable group. Only a mom and her baby are the only stable unit in chimp society. Very different than most social animals that we're familiar with. Um, they break up and come together unpredictably throughout the day. They fission and then they fuse. And so there's a community, we call it a community, not a group, of anywhere from a couple of dozen to a couple of hundred animals. But during the day, every day, they, they're, they're splitting up and coming together. Um, and that's really interesting about them. Males, on the other hand, um, have a career also, but it's a different sort of a career. So I like to cite the example of this is my favorite male that we, I worked with, uh, whose name is Frodo, was Frodo, he died a few years ago. But here's Frodo on the upper left when he was a teenager, and he was a massively powerful, muscular, but not very socially bright teenage, like many 18-year-old males, not a very socially <laughs> adept male. He was powerful in terms of brute strength. Um, he was not a kind, gentle animal at all. But he didn't have the social smarts to make his way in chimp society politically. That changed as he got older, of course. And so he became an alpha male eventually, the high-ranking male, the top-ranking male. And when he was in his 20s and 30s, he was this big, handsome guy on the right. And then, because he led this kind of a fast-track, hard life of challenging other males and being big, and he did a lot of hunting with the other males. I'll come back to that. Um, he, he contracted a disease that we don't know what it was, and he died at a relatively young age of 37. This was only a few days before he died. But the interesting point is that during this time, between the, and he began, we know from paternity studies that we can now do, you know, we can collect hairs. They, they shed hairs in the nest that they make. Every night they make a leafy nest, different nest every night. They shed hairs in it just like you shed hairs onto your pillow, and in the morning we can collect the hairs from the nest, and we can collect DNA from those hairs, and we can figure out who's fathered whom, even if we have no idea who actually made it with whom overall. And we know that he was fathering babies when he was 12, and he was still fathering babies when he was 37. So he's the same male genetically, he's just not the same male visually. So that's interesting that the females seem to like him and prefer him. He was from a powerful lineage. Female chimpanzees uh, are, and I don't like to use this word promiscuous, it's a human term that kind of sounds like a negative, but female chimpanzees are wildly promiscuous. They mate with many, many males. My colleague Dave Watts at Yale recorded, I think, the maximum figure, which was a female at his study site in Uganda who mated with 18 males a total of 65 times in one day. And so why do they do, why do, they do this? 
They do it for a couple of reasons. First, it's strategic to form these, even if they're brief alliances or bonds, with a lot of males. Males are nasty, they're aggressive, they're not nice to you, they're not nice to your offspring. But if you form these alliances with them, you might hope to mitigate their bad behavior in the future. And also, maybe more importantly, when you do this, if you mate with, that's an extreme number, 18 males, but if you mate with uh, eight males at the same time that you're ovulating, then the baby is born eight and a half months later, and each male has a one-eighth chance of having been the father. So that's 12 and a half percent. That may be enough of a chance that you're the father to inhibit you from being aggressive toward that baby, which males sometimes are aggressive toward babies of, uh, that might be fathered by other males. So it's a strategic behavior by female chimpanzees, this, this kind of a wanton mating with lots and lots of males. So when Goodall went out in the early days of her research, I was saying that she you know, got labeled as being somebody who anthropomorphized and she should, she should be more scientific. But one of the things that she wrote about that we hadn't really thought that much about was how kinship influences chimp society. These two males on the right are brothers. That's um, Freud in the back and Frodo in the front. And you know, again, a, a little baby here, who's, uh, that's actually one of Gaia's offspring. And the, the role of kinship is profoundly important. Right, so these males are, you know, maybe you want to think of this in Shakespearean terms. These males have all sorts of reason to cooperate, to conspire, and they'll use these alliances to overthrow more powerful males. In, individually, they don't have the ability, either the strength or the bravado or the cunning, to overthrow a higher ranking male and try to assume the top rank in the society, in the community, but together they do. And then after they do that, if one of them achieves the top rank, or maybe they even share the top rank, then if they're brothers, they may continue to kind of live sort of as an alliance for some period of time. But if they're not brothers and they got together anyway, because you know, animals B and C can overthrow animal A, then that conspiracy kind of falls apart and they turn on each other. And they do sometimes injure each other severely in fights. So again, I, you know, I would say, if you want to understand um, you know, chimps just look at Shakespeare, but actually it's more like if you want to understand Shakespeare, you should be look, looking at chimps, because that's kind of the direction that it actually was based on. So there is a, there's a lot of conspiracy making. The reason we find them so fascinating is that they're smart animals who make these decisions on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. You know, we've all, those of us who work with these guys, have all seen um, male chimps literally shift their alliances from moment to moment in order to get something better for themselves. You know, they know that they can't overthrow this guy, but then suddenly some other animal appears in the clearing, and suddenly the context has changed, and now he gangs up with that animal on the animal he'd like to overthrow. So there's this very, very quick and subtle and smart um, political reckoning that goes on. All right, so the work that I did was not on something as sexy as what I was just saying. It was mostly on diet and feeding and the stuff that they eat and why do they eat it and how do they find it. So chimpanzees are, are amazing forest rangers. They have an extraordinary spatial memory. It's like if I locked one of you into Whole Foods for a year, no, for 10 years, and, and it was the biggest Whole Foods, it was Whole Foods that was the size of all of San Pedro. And you lived in it 24 seven for years and years. You would know where everything was, right? You'd know what month the peaches were, were gonna be good and you'd know where to find the frozen this and you'd know everything because even though it's a big, big place you're living in, it's your life, it's your day-to-day -day life. And that's the way it is for chimpanzees. So they have to navigate this very complex tropical forest that contains tens of thousands of trees, and they need to do that efficiently, and they need to be able to find the fruits that they need. Most of their diet is ripe fruit, about three quarters of their diet or so, and ripe fruit is not stationary. Ripe fruit, and the trees are stationary, but ripe fruit comes out, it's available for a few weeks or less, and then it's gone until next year, and then other trees have ripe fruit. So you need to move from food patch to food patch throughout the year, and you need to be able to do that, probably not just randomly, but with some sense of, I think I know where to find the best food tomorrow. So the tree that this guy is in, as you can see, it's a fig tree. It's actually the only fig tree of that species in the whole national park at Gombe. And every September, they would find this tree. They'd check it out a few times to see when the fruits seemed like they were ripe, then they'd go back when, it when they were ripe, and they would spend days just gorging themselves, like literally gorging themselves until they could not walk. they just lie on, the, lie on their backs on the ground, completely distended stomachs, really gross, and just happy, right? Just happy. 
Okay, why did they do this? Because it's their fruits. They're carbs, carb-rich, sugar-rich, energy-rich. Why does the tree not just die when it completely is denuded of all its fruit, just overnight practically? Well, because th this is what the tree wants, right? The tree has m literally sometimes a million figs or hundreds of thousands of figs. They're packed with, with uh, seeds. Those seeds will now be passed through the chimp's digestive system and be pooped out somewhere else not in the shadow of that tree where they won't grow, but maybe 100 meters away or maybe a kilometer away as the chimps move. So it's the way for the tree to reproduce, to, to persuade the chimps to carry their, their progeny basically away. And in fact, if you, you know, if you go to the market, we all know this intuitively, but we don't think about it. Uh, when you want to find good fruit in the market, you want to pick the best peaches or mangoes you all know that there are just a few qualities that you need to know, right, to decide whether this is, you can't eat it in the market, somebody's gonna yell at you, but you can squeeze it, and it, it's soft if it's ripe. You can smell it, and it smells ripe, it smells sugary, um, and it also changes color, right? It's not green anymore, it gets to be orange or red or yellow, and those are all the signals that the chimps use as well. And guess what? All of those features of fruit that we use as well as the chimps do evolve for exactly that purpose, to try to persuade somebody to come along and pick them and take them, you know, the ancestors of mangoes and peaches, to take them off somewhere, eat them, and then poop out the seeds with a pit somewhere else so that it could grow into a tree. So it's a nice system that's evolved. And as I said, the diet is, is mostly ripe fruit, but there's also a leafy component. They also eat insects, I'll come back to, and they also eat meat as well, and I'll come back to that. So, one of the most important things that we've learned about chimpanzees in the past 20 years, as the long-term studies have accumulated, is we understand how important culture is to them, cultural traditions. There are many things that your cat does that you think it learned to do from you. Many of those things it would have done anyway, right? Cats are very solitary animals, and a lot of the stuff that they do in their lives was somewhere there genetically. It may, you know, they're hunting. If you let them out in the yard and they hunt birds or mice, then they do improve their hunting skills through practice, but the hunting skills were there. And all the other stuff that they do, whether it's cleaning themselves or whatever, it's, it's cat genes, right? It's not like that for chimpanzees. They're more complex than that. And so things like, cultural traditions, these are all tools, blades of grass and twigs that the chimps are inserting into termite mounds, big earthen mounds filled with millions upon millions of termites. The termites rush to the surface to protect their tunnels when the chimps scratch them open with their fingernails. They put the tool in, the termites grab the stick, the chimp withdraws the stick with dozens of termites on it. I had a graduate student who studied the nutrition of these termites. They're packed with carbs and protein and fat. They're a great treat. And sometimes uh, the chimps in some parts of Africa are doing something different. The guy on the right there is in Ivory Coast in West Africa, and he's using a rock that he collected in the rainforest to hammer open nuts. And that was a major discovery made by another colleague of mine, Christoph Bosch, a Swiss primatologist in the late 70s. And we now know that there's a pretty sophisticated tool culture that exists across Africa. Sticks in one place, stones in another place. Archaeologists are now actually doing chimp archaeology and excavating earth in rainforests and finding 5,000-year-old tool assemblages there, just the way you might find 5,000-year-old assemblages of human tools. Uh, another kind of tool that Goodall discovered, uh, leaf sponges. So this is a gremlin, an old female. She takes a, a leaf and she chews on it. Then she pops it into some water, like in a stream, or often into a cavity in a tree where there's rainwater. She couldn't reach the rainwater with her fingers, but with the leafy wadge that she's made, uh, she, it soaks up the water, she pops it into her mouth, and she gets to drink water that way. That was one of Goodall's really big early tool discoveries, and their kids learned to do this also, but it takes about two to four years. Girls far better at doing this than, than boy chimps are. Now, it's interesting, their manual dexterity is notably better, female chimpanzee, as babies in particular. So, uh, these traditions, and again, here's a, here's a female hammering, and her baby is nursing, but maybe also watching to some extent. So there's a lot of observational learning. Some reports that the mom may actually mold the baby's hands a little bit, kind of the way that a human mom might try to teach her child to, you know, to do penmanship by gripping a pen or something like that. Uh, so there's a lot of this that happens in chimp society, and we used to argue about whether chimps were cultural 
in the way that we are or not, and now we have to acknowledge that they have a simpler version, but nevertheless a real version of cultural behavior. All right, a few more highlights of chimp behavior before we turn to, before we turn to dolphins. So my own work, if you just Googled what I do or looked at a lot of the articles that I've published, is about meat eating and hunting. So in human evolution, one of the really interesting, cool questions is, when did our own ancestors begin to eat meat? How did they catch it? And how much did they eat and how often and those kinds of things? And those are all questions that archeologists and biologists have been looking at for a very long time. My approach to this, um, with, when I was working with Goodall, was to try to understand chimpanzees as predators, because they're big time predators. They're ruthless predators. They're more efficient as predators. That is, their success rate at killing animals is, is about 50%. That's far higher than lions, hyenas, wolves, cheetahs, leopards. They're really very efficient at doing this. And when they are uh, hunting, they're usually hunting one of just a few things. Um, the, this guy on the upper left is eating uh, a monkey called a red colobus monkey. Colobus monkeys are kind of the size of a big house cat, and that's their most frequent prey. They also eat baboons. They also eat baby uh, antelope fawns. They also eat piglets of wild pigs. It's a very political thing. This guy, uh, the alpha here, a Wilkie, has the skull of a monkey, and he's politically doling out scraps of meat to his allies, and then withholding scraps of meat from his rivals. So he's kind of publicly snubbing individuals he wants to kind of embarrass or snub. He'll also share liberally with females he might want to mate with. So there's a whole political element to this, aside from the nutritional element, that it's obviously good calories and fat and protein and so forth. And um, the, the act of hunting is really kind of amazing and can be brutal. There's a chimp on the upper slide who's grabbing a colobus monkey baby. They're not very good at escaping. And um, they do a lot of hand-to-hand -hand combat. You see here, that's Frodo challenging a male. The male monkeys attack the chimps. They bite them. The, the, the goal of the chimps usually is to try to not kill a male, which is kind of dangerous, but rather to grab a female or especially a baby, which is about the size of a kitten. And then that meat becomes very sought after. And over here, you see, uh, first of all, begging behavior. Chimps beg just the way we beg, by sticking their hand out and asking, you know, kind of supplicating for a piece of meat. And on the upper right, you might be able to see that this guy is mating with a female, and he's got a carcass of a monkey in his hand, one hand, and he's not sharing with her until they've made it. So it's a really Machiavellian <laughs> behavior. Um, and it's a fascinating one. All right, so violence. So I have a couple of, um, not really very gross, but slightly gross slides coming up. But um, uh, chimpanzee males do something that when we first saw it, when Goodall first observed it in the 70s, we thought it was pathological behavior, abnormal. People questioned whether it was real or not. Today we recognize that it's a routine, real part of chimp life, that males are violent, that males have this dark side. It's been seen at every chimp site that's been worked at in Africa, that males will occasionally patrol, as these guys are doing, their territorial boundary. On the other side of the boundary, an invisible boundary to us, but well known to them, there is another community of chimps and another group of males who also patrol sometimes. And the goal of these males is not really to engage in a full-fledged kind of you know, combat with the other males. That would be very scary and dangerous. It's not that different. The rough analogy might be a military patrol doesn't really want to engage in a firefight with a more powerful or equally powerful group of the enemy. They really, these guys are looking for stragglers and individuals who might be lost and attempting to maybe move the territory out a little bit by pushing the others further into their territory. They're also sometimes looking for females. And they do this by going to the edge of the territory like these males have done, looking over into the next ravine or the next valley. This slide at the lower right is a male chimpanzee who was killed by a group of chimps. One of my graduate students was following. Uh, and around dusk, uh, this incredible chaos happened. They stumbled onto a male who was clearly lost from another community. He couldn't get away. The males that my student was following pinned this guy to the ground while other males attacked him and basically just beat him to death. And then the next day they came back and they autopsied him and you can see all the vegetation is flattened around him. So this is something that happens rarely but regularly. And in fact, the homicide rate for chimpanzees is more or less the same as what we see in large American cities, meaning it's a lot. So this was something that when it was discovered, again, we, people accused Goodall of 
messing with the chimps somehow, interfering with their natural behavior, but today we recognize it's an unpleasant but natural part of what they do. Um, these are not chimpanzees, these are bonobos, but a lot of people have looked to chimps and bonobos to try to understand the roots of our own sexuality, and I'll just point out that bonobos are kind of special. For those of you who know about them, this is my only bonobo slide. Um, it's my only porn slide also. And it's, um, it's uh, two bonobos in the San Diego Zoo uh, uh, who are actually both female who are engaging in sexual behavior, and they do this, um, they do this in order to reconcile after a spat, they do this in order to reduce tension in the group. They do this more in captivity than they do in the wild, but it's a regular feature of bonobo life. And males also do this with other males, and males and females also do this together. They're simply very sexual. And the important thing to point out here is that, as in humans, it's not just for procreation. That's the main, that's the bottom line. This is something that's done as social communication, bonding, reconciliation. It's not just about creating, and in every other animal that you can think of, mating happens for the purpose of creating offspring, right? And when that is not possible, um, it basically doesn't happen, or it very rarely happens, but bonobos do this routinely, as we do. Um, and so last couple of chimp-related slides. So lifespan is an interesting question. I do a whole other lecture that's about sort of the biomedical aspects of chimps and humans, and this is just a couple of slides related to that. So this is the actual only, the, the actual oldest authenticated human being ever. It's a French lady. You see other figures given, like Guinness Book of World Record figures. Many of those are just uh, fiction, and this is the only one that we really know for sure. 122 years old, uh, Jean Kama, and she you know, was an outlier. She outlived her grandchildren. She smoked and drank red wine because she was French. She just did all this stuff that doesn't usually contribute to a long life, but whatever. And, um, and then we have the oldest known chimpanzee, 66, so kind of about half the lifespan. A huge difference is that this lady had presumably stopped cycling, stopped having reproductive, potentially reproductive cycles, what, maybe uh, 70 or more years earlier? So 70 years post-reproductively? Or this is a male chimp, Gregoire, but if this were a female, then it might be reproducing even at this age, or almost at this age. So we're built on an interestingly similar but also interestingly different body plan. And those who have, over the years, tried to justify bio biomedical experiments on chimps because of our similarity, uh, a, a lot of those have been invalidated, including a whole host of cancers that we get that they don't get, which is kind of another lecture. And then I'll just mention, finally, the HIV situation. You know, we know today perfectly well that HIV um, and, and AIDS, the disease that, it, that follows from it, is a disease that originated in chimpanzees, where it was a different virus called SIV, simian immunodeficiency virus. We thought for a long time that SIV was harmless in chimpanzees, and now we know because of more data and many years of study that it's not harmless. It doesn't kill them outright. It doesn't lead to a disease like AIDS so regularly or so rapidly, but uh, chimps who are SIV positive are much more likely to die when they have the flu or a cold or when females are pregnant or when there are any, are any stressors in their lives. And that's something that we've only known for about the last 10 years. So we believe that SIV is a virus that evolved maybe 5,000 years ago or so, that popped in, that mutated, and chimps have had time to uh, adapt to it, meaning many have died, those that survived had some kind of immunity to it, and HIV is a much, much newer virus, only 100 and some years, so that kind of process has not happened with us yet. So that's, again, a revelation just of the last decade or so in chimp research. Now let me just turn to dolphins. I went, when I was doing this work and writing this book, I went to a couple of the marine mammal meetings, huge meetings. There are lots of marine biologists who work with whales and dolphins or captive dolphins, wild dolphins, and I would, I would always talk about how difficult it was to study chimpanzees because you're in a tropical forest, you're in another country, you're dealing with tropical diseases and poisonous snakes and sometimes political chaos and you're doing lots of hard work, I would lose like 25 pounds in six weeks of doing research, and, and then they would all say, yeah, yeah, but your animals don't live underwater, deep <laughs> underwater. So for the most part, studying dolphins and studying any marine animal is very, very, very difficult, and it took a very long time to get anything like the kinds of observations that we can get in a short time on animals that live in the air or live in the forest, right? 
Um, even people who studied dolphins off the coast here, like my colleague Manoleta Bayarzi I mentioned, are dealing with murky water, cold water. You can't get into the water and swim with the dolphins, contrary to the views that many might have, because the dolphins are just gone like that. So you need to figure out ways to study them from a boat. The logistics are really difficult. So I feel very fortunate now that I did my work in the tropical forest and had all sorts of diseases and <laughs> stepped on vipers and all that kind of thing. So we have many studies of dolphins, but not all that great information. But of course, the importance of this is that these animals are built on an utterly different body plan, share most of the same organ systems that great apes have, of course, and that we have, and that they are extraordinarily smart. And every year, as with chimpanzees, every year we're learning more and more about the cognitive abilities that these dolphins have. I'm talking mainly here about bottlenose dolphins, by the way, but I'll mention a few others. And the, the fact that we know what we know is due to a few extraordinary circumstances. So for one thing, you know, here, is a, here are a couple of river dolphins, Amazon river dolphins on the right. We know so little about these guys, and they're in such danger of extinction. There are various species around the world. Um, Asia and Latin America especially, because they live in extremely dim, murky water. They're little, they're persecuted, they're caught in fishermen's nets and whatnot. So we really don't know much about their social lives. Um, on the other hand, there are a few extraordinary circumstances. So this is a, of a place called uh, Shark Bay in Western Australia near Perth. There's a very famous long-term study of bottlenose dolphins that are living in a place called Monkey Maya and living in a bay where for decades now, they have been uh, receiving food from picnickers on the beach. And after some period of time, the community, and dolphins live in communities just as chimps do, they don't live in groups or pods or whatever, we call them communities. Um, at some point, some of the community began approaching the beach to get these handouts. And then they became so habituated to people, they began to come out of the water onto the beach. And you can YouTube this and look at some of these videos, they're kind of amazing. And people would wade down into knee-deep water, and the dolphins would literally follow them out of the water onto the beach until they could practically not get back into the water. So um, a couple of old friends of mine who were graduate students at the time uh, at University of Michigan went out to Shark Bay, and they set up a project. And they did this for years, and they were joined by Australians, and they were joined by many Michigan graduate students and postdocs, and they learned a great deal about these guys because they were incredibly observable. They were like Jane Goodall's chimpanzees, utterly used to people. And the other thing about Shark Bay that was a really nice feature was it's a shallow, crystal clear water bay. So you could be in a, in a small boat, and you could get really nice observations of the animals, even when they were not you know, here on the beach begging, but when they went offshore and were behaving more like dolphins are supposed to behave. So bottlenose dolphins, uh, we've all seen them. You, know, you don't have to go very far from where we're standing right now to see them. They are, they are our inshore dolphins. They live in shallow water just beyond the breakers, typically. Um, if you want to see the other dolphins, you need to go further off into the deeper water. And the channel that's right here out of, out of Long Beach Harbor is a place where you're going to see several dolphins, maybe five dolphin species. These guys are the inshore species. What's interesting is, and work that was done in the last 20 years or so, is that the dolphins that you might see when you're at the beach in Venice or wherever, and they're just beyond the breakers in shallow water in twos and threes, um, they're not typically the same dolphins that you would see if you went to Catalina. And there are other bottlenose dolphins in the shallow waters around Catalina and the Channel Islands, but they're a different gene pool. That is, they don't cross back and forth just randomly. They're highly adapted to living in shallow water and feeding in shallow water. So we know a lot about bottlenose dolphins, right? They're all over the world. I've watched them. I watched them in Scotland. The population of bottlenose dolphins in Scotland, if anybody's ever seen these guys, are enormously bigger. They're almost black. They're really, really dark. They're considered the same species. Um, and you can find them in tropical seas, you can find them in, obviously Scotland is very cold water, um, but they're truly worldwide. They live in these same fission fusion societies, and uh, they, they're very much about male alliances. And I said earlier that chimps feed on fruit, which of course the fruit trees don't move, but the fruit kind of does move because one month this fruit is available and then it's gone. And then a month later, this other fruit is available and they may be miles apart. And the chimps have to kind of map where they're gonna go and what's available and travel all over the forest. So they're feeding on a, a movable feast and not a sedentary one. And dolphins, of course, do the same thing except they're feeding on schools of fish that literally are moving every minute and every day. So my, my colleagues who worked in Australia 
recorded things that, that we hadn't known at that point about bottlenose dolphins. And I just also mentioned they were in, most of them were in a psychology department at Michigan at the time. The psychologists were like, what, why are you studying dolphins? You're psychologists. And they said, because there's something important here to understand about the mind based on our work on dolphins. And in the end, they were, they were vindicated because the work that they did was really very, very important. So we have males swimming synchronously. They, they demonstrate their alliances and their kinship, not by grooming one another, which is what chimps often do, you know, running their hands through somebody else's hair and picking out parasites, but by this stuff. Um, males also get together, and these are three males who are herding a female. So males will um, invade, basically, other parts, other communities. They'll try to separate a female. They'll herd her. They'll, um, they'll forcibly mate with her. They'll be kind of brutal to her. They do a lot of nasty stuff that we also see male chimps conspiring to do. And this was something that wasn't really known until these guys did the research in, back in the 90s. And then we have a lot of, of, of behavior, tail slapping and communicative behavior that is the social communication that bottomless dolphins engage in. So it's a much more socially complex set of behaviors than we used to think that they did. Um, I mentioned uh, cultural traditions. And I showed you some chimpanzee tools, and you may have been thinking, well, there's no parallel here because obviously bottlenose dolphins don't have hands or fingers, so what are they going to be doing tool-wise? But we now know that they do use tools, right? So these are natural sponges that occur in Shark Bay. And for about, I think, several years, the researchers saw these particular dolphins only uh, swimming with natural sponges attached to their, their rostra, their beaks, right? They're not, they're not their noses or their snouts as we like to refer to them, but their, their beaks. And they didn't know what they were doing with them or why. They noticed, and this has been published since many times, that it, it was particular um, lineages, related animals usually, that were doing this. So it would be an individual dolphin might learn by watching his or her mom do this behavior, and then they would begin doing it. It turns out what they're doing with these sponges is they're using them as cushions so that when they go down into the bottom and they dig in the sand looking for stuff to eat, mollusks and so forth, that they have some protection against the abrasion of the sand. So the point is, it's a tool. They're using a tool. They don't have hands to use it, but they're using their rostra to do it. And what's really cool is that the use of the tool, and the, it, it was invented clearly by somebody. It was innovated. And the use of the tool then is happening through cultural transmission that happens along very cleanly defined lines of relatedness. All right, let me mention a few other things about dolphins, but turn to common dolphins. You know, if you've gone offshore, and I know many of you have, go to Catalina, go across Santa Monica Bay, or go anywhere, and you see these very large schools, pods of dolphins. These are usually common dolphins, either long-beaked or short-beaked common dolphins, and they can, be, they can be hundreds and hundreds, they can be a thousand or more. And these are the guys who are also worldwide distribution and also found uh, this time in both coastal waters and also offshore deeper waters. Some of their relatives are, are very good cooperative hunters. And so these are dusky dolphins, and they are the guys that have been recorded to uh, encircle schools of fish and kind of round them into, um, herd them into kind of a funnel shape, and then pass quickly back and forth through the funnel to grab as many fish per, per sweep as they can. So cooperative hunting. So when I showed you the images of the chimps and the monkeys, what they're doing is fundamentally like what they were doing. So again, we have this interesting set of behaviors that they also must learn. They may have some genetic predisposition to doing it, but they also must learn to do what they're doing. Um, so Madalena, years ago, did her study. We met because she was studying sympatric, meaning living in the same place, dolphins, in Santa Monica Bay, white-sided, common, bottlenose dolphins. And I was doing work in Africa on chimps and gorillas living in the same forest. We thought, how interesting, these big brain mammals living in multiple species assortments. Let's write about the parallels here. And just to show you a little bit of her work, she was looking at um, bottlenose and common dolphins. And she found that, as you might expect, as we know now, this is an undersea map, by the way, of Santa Monica Bay, that the dolphins, the common dolphins, are in deeper water. They're using a, a deeper water column for feeding. The bottlenose are using shallow water. So they're probably avoiding head-to-head -head competition for the most part by simply specializing on different water depths in order to go hunting. And then finally, I want to mention um, orcas, which are, of course, basically dolphins too. So orcas are fascinating and still not very well understood. One of the things that's not very well understood, I, was, I did a trip to Antarctica with some USC alumni recently, and we saw the whole multitude of now 
we don't even know what to call them yet. Kind of, we call them orcas type A, type B, and type C. Perhaps, perhaps multiple species that look very much alike, but live in the same place with one another. And orcas are worldwide also. They're usually in cold water. And the really cool and difficult to understand thing about orcas is that they live in these populations that we call resident and transient. We call them resident and transient mainly because when they were originally discovered a long time ago, people thought that literally there was a resident orca population in a place like the waters off Vancouver, for instance, and then there was another transient population that was just passing through because they didn't mingle at all. They didn't mate with each other. They didn't associate with each other. They literally were like two separate species on top of one another without, without any interaction, even though they looked almost identical. And then we learned that over time they were actually behaving differently and eating different foods. So we learned that, for instance, in Alaska, you have the transient population eating almost entirely seals and sea lions, right, and not birds. And then you have the resident population in exactly the same water eating mostly salmon. So that was really interesting. You have two pretty much identical populations that don't mate with each other and have completely different diets, so different traditions of what they eat. And we're still trying to understand this. The picture is more complicated than when I made this slide because now there's a third, at least a third, um, I, don't think, I don't know the name for it other than A, B, and C, um, a type of orca that's also found in some of the same waters. And you've all seen this, these uh, documentary footage of the orcas coming out of the water in Patagonia to try to nail those um, sea lions. So this is an old uh, figure that we still sometimes like to refer to, and that is just to point out that the, the degree to which the brain is an important part of the body is greatly elaborated, of course, in humans, right? We have this mushroom size, mushroom-shaped brain that just expanded so much in recent years. We're kind of built like a, a long a bean pole balancing a plate on top or something, right? We have this tall, skinny posture and a big head filled with a big brain. Uh, great apes and the, and the odontocetes, the toothed whales and dolphins, are the other group that are also the most encephalized groups on the planet. So you can look at this two ways, actually. You could say, well, isn't it interesting that we have this one planet that we know about, just one planet that we really know about, and on that one planet, there are these two lineages of big-brained animals. That suggests that that this kind of thing might be, might be common in, in the universe if we discover life elsewhere. Or you might say, how incredibly rare that we have this planet with tens of millions, hundreds of millions of species on it, and really just two lineages that have become big-brained and highly sophisticated socially. So last couple of slides here, the parallels between the two, what did they suggest about the evolution of intelligence? So these traits, again, represent a suite that are found, some of them are found in other animals. If we were talking tonight about wolves, we could see some of these traits present because they're socially sophisticated in their own way. They hunt cooperatively and so forth. However, there's, there are no other groups that have all of these things occurring together other than the dolphins and the, and the great apes. So um, this is intriguing. And of course, both species, bo both groups also are endangered. Chimpanzees, along with bonobos, orangutans, and gorillas, all endangered species. We worry, we worry a lot about many of the marine mammals. We know far, far less about their population status, not just for the dolphins, but for some of the beaked whales. We know, we know very, very little. So there's a lot to know, um, and some of the animals are disappearing before we can even uh, learn what we want to learn about them. And I think I will, I've talked a lot, I think I will stop there. And if you have questions about either species or both, I'll try to answer them for you. Thanks a lot. Where do we get funding to do this research? Um, there are a lot of, found, there, there's a National Science Foundation, of course, that's the US government. The funding environment is really, really bad these days, probably not surprising. So a lot of the big funding agencies, what is it, about 4% or 3% of proposals are accepted. So that's really low. Um, a lot of foundations are out there. So a lot of my graduate students, you know, graduate students are used to doing work on a shoestring budget, um, are getting money from foundations, private foundations. Um, in my own field for chimpanzees, you have National Geographic, the Leakey Foundation, which is in San Francisco, and many others like that, all of which have budgets that are, 
that are modest, but where a few thousand dollars is available if you apply and it's competitive. So that's kind of been the tradition for most of us. I'm always amazed that I have colleagues at USC who do, you know, astrophysics or they do some sort of chemistry and they complain because they only have $5 million, $10 million. <laughs> and we, we I, I, I'll give you one, one example. I, I bragged once to my colleagues in biology at USC uh, who do great stuff and they do a lot of marine biology that I ran a project I didn't talk about tonight for 10 years in Uganda on gorillas and chimpanzees. And it, it was, some of it was, you know, uh, really high profile stuff that got covered by the media and I ran the entire project for 10 years for $300,000. That included four employees, me going back and forth, graduate students, that's $30,000 a year. And they looked at me as if I was from Mars because that's so, li that's so little. Um, so you can do really good science with, with not so many resources. It's just not easy. And it depends on the field that you're in. Yes? Has a chimpanzee ever met a dolphin? <laughs> oh. <laughs> You know, that's a really great question. Nobody's ever asked me. I mean, maybe one that fell off a diving board. I don't know. No, I, I really don't know. I would guess that somebody you know, tried something like that. Certainly video, but um, there's a little bit of a medium problem, right? Water versus air. Chimps are notoriously awful at dealing with water. I mean, in a very serious way. Chimps have drowned in zoos in water that was only up to their waist. Because they, unless they're savvy about water, they freak out and they literally, I mean, there are many zoos have put exhibits in, spent millions of dollars with a moat and not thought about the fact that the chimps don't know what to do with a moat, so they just fall in. So that wouldn't be easy, but if you had water savvy chimps, um, you could have some sort of an interaction, sure. I don't think it's ever been done, though. Yes, yeah. How do they know their own kinship? Yeah. Probably don't understand their kinship in the way that we might understand it, but they certainly, if they grew up together, same mom and they're socializing from the time they're babies, they learn to, they learn to treat these individuals differently. So they don't, have this, they don't have the abstract conception of kinship. That, Why would the males be less aggressive? The males would be less aggressive toward each other if they're brothers. But you mean, so, so the male would be less aggressive toward a young chimp because it would not be a conscious thing, but there would be a long-term tendency, cognitively, that if there's a 12% chance or a 30% chance that you're the father, you don't, you don't kill this baby, or you don't attack this baby. They don't, have to, they don't have to know it consciously, but it's something that over, over millennia would have been something that select, was selected for by evolution. That individuals who did kill their own babies would of course be, they'd be losing their own genes, they'd be eliminating their own genes, so they wouldn't do that, okay? Yes, yep, yes. You showed that the chimpanzees had killed one from another chimpanzee group, mm -hmm. but they didn't eat it no. like they would a monkey. So right. there a taboo against eating right. their own kind? Yeah, that's interesting. No, they typically, when they had these inter-community encounters, that, that Jane Goodall called them warfare in the early days. We don't usually call them warfare because it's more like a commando raid or something. It's one, and, it's one against a group, it's not group against a group. But they, they clearly don't see these victims as a food source. The only time they ever do that would be if they attack a female and she has a baby. And maybe the female escapes, but her most vulnerable part, which was her infant, they grab from her. They might actually eat, eat the baby, but no, this is not about cannibalism at all. It's about conquest of territory. It's about uh, killing your rivals because they're, they literally, the more males you have, the larger your territory will probably be. So it's very much about territory and it may also be about females to some extent. Not about, not about nutrition. Yes. Is there more aggression in which? Is, is there aggression between females? Oh, between females, yeah. So when you see these images, I don't know if there are any in my talk, but if you see images like in a documentary of female chimps sitting together, they really don't like each other. They're sitting together because their babies are playing together typically. So it's kind of a nursery thing. Female chimps, as I, as I said, female chimps migrate. Males, I didn't actually say this, the Fish and Fusion Society also consists of males growing up and living their whole lives together. So brothers stay together. And that's why they had these, long, these lifelong alliances. Females reach puberty and they migrate somewhere else. So they arrive in another community along with other females from other communities and they're kind of like hostile sisters-in-law. <laughs> Maybe not totally hostile, but they're not, they're not friendly. So they don't have a big incentive to do stuff together because they're not related to each other at all. 
So, and the same is more or less true of dolphins. I know that a lot of infant mortality in dolphins primarily happens from males who are not the father, who are from outside another community, coming in and killing them. And in some communities, the, the Scottish study that I mentioned has a really high rate of infanticide, of males killing the infants that were fathered by males of other communities. It's one of the, the dark things that dolphins do. Yes. How do speech capabilities compare between dolphins and chimps? I'm not sure how much I can really say about that for dolphins. I know there's a lot of research on captive dolphins going on. Um, I mean, we know that because there, there's, there's, there, there's, the, there's the speech and communication that might learn in captivity, like chimps having been taught sign language or to use a symbol board. And there's the, there are the people who teach dolphins to make human-like sounds. But that's, of course, neither of those is really related to their natural communication system. So chimps have a natural communication system that's complex. And it consists of gestural communication, like the begging, and, and a lot of vocal communication as well. And what dolphins do is way, way harder to understand. You know, we know that dolphins have um, signature whistles that, that identify them as individuals to others, clearly, and that the babies have signature whistles that resemble those of their mom. So there's a lot of that stuff. But I think, uh, you know, in the wild, it's really hard to get a handle on this because they live in the water. So there, are, there have been, there's been a lot of good captive work done in Hawaii, for instance, on, on dolphin cognition in captivity, at least. But I can speak really better to what, what great apes do. And um, what they do in the wild is they make use of a relatively small number of sounds that, depending on context, convey a huge amount of meaning. That's basically what they do. Whereas in captivity, you raise them as children, and you know, chimps or bonobos can be taught hundreds of signs. They can be taught to use as many signs as a human toddler would use words and understand a thousand. So if you've seen any of these videos, they're kind of amazing. That people who question whether that's quote language, I mean it's it's very language-ish if it's not language. Yep. Hey, no, Have the chimps learned anything from the people who are watching them? <laughs> yeah, we well, we talk about that a lot actually. Um, in fact, Jane herself had this theory that the chimps. Um, in West Africa who cracked nuts with stones might have learned to do that by just sitting around villages in the trees watching people using hammers and whatnot. So um, I, I, will, I don't know the answer, but I will say that chimps learn incredibly quickly from other chimps. And they don't learn nearly as effect effectively from watching humans. You can model behavior in captivity and teach a baby chimp to do what you've done usually, but they, if another chimp does it, they'll pick it up just like that. So they're sat around discussing what the <laughs> they might they might be doing they might be doing that. That's what, to get inside their heads is kind of the challenge. Sorry, yeah, it's yeah, it's hard to get inside their heads, is that that's the big challenge. Anybody else? Yes. Yeah. Were you in a lot of danger when you studied chimpanzees? from the chimps themselves? From the chimps themselves. Um, yeah, we, we, I was attacked a couple of times. The, this guy Frodo I mentioned is a, was a really big chimp. He's died. But he was um, one of the chimps who in the early days of Jane Goodall's work, and you've seen maybe this in documentaries, uh, she interacted with him, or he, he interacted with her. They were little you know, infants. They'd toddle up and untie her shoes and that kind of thing. And those chimps grew up, some of them, to be absolutely unafraid of people. So the chimps are, they've mostly been born with people watching them. So they treat us, and we don't feed them, of course, and we don't harass them, of course, so they treat us like we're just rocks. And in fact, I always tell the story that the first time I ever saw a wild chimp was I was taken out pre-dawn in the dark to find the chimps. They were just waking up from their nests. They sleep in nests at night. And we were walking up in the dark on a steep hillside with lots of boulders. And I leaned down to put my hand on a boulder, and it was the head of a chimp who was kind of like just waking up, kind of groggy on the ground, kind of flinched, like, do you not know that I'm a chimp and not a boulder? And, and so they don't really respond in any way to us at all. But occasionally, you have a chimp that is fearless, has no flight distance, and is actually then aggressive. And so. Yeah, I mean, yes, it's, it's a little bit dangerous. It's not really very dangerous, but Frodo, in this case, you know, kind of drag, dragged me around a little, and then you just treat it like a bear attack. He's not biting, they don't bite you, that's the main thing, because biting would be really dangerous. They mainly, you just want to not have them like break a rib or something when they're dragging you. And I have friends who've been dragged by gorillas, that's far more. And they don't, they, they're just playing. They just, they're 400 pounds, they just drag you, so. <laughs> But yeah, that's not, I mean, of the different things that can happen to you in rural Africa, that's way down on the list of the, <laughs> to be honest, of the things that might happen. So. Yes, yeah. I have yeah. one more question. Yes. Yeah. 
if the chimps come across a person rather than our chirp, rather, um, well, connected to the last question. Um, so Frodo, after I was done working with him and at Gombe in 2004, three, something like that, exactly that happened. Frodo came across a woman in the forest who was not supposed to be in the, it's a national park. She wasn't allowed to be there. She had a baby with her. She had actually like a toddler with her who was in her conga, wrapped in cloth on her back, and Frodo attacked her and killed the baby. And so that was very bad, and then there was a long discussion. What do we do about this? And the conclusion was, well, he's being a chimp, and chimps eat meat, and babies are sadly also represent potential prey. So nothing was done except that we made sure that local people didn't walk through the forest anymore, especially with children. Um, but yeah, no, they're, I mean, they're predators. I, actually, I would, I'd be sitting in the forest sometimes with the chimps, and Gambia is in Tanzania, but it's very close to the border with um, uh, Burundi and then Rwanda. And we, we get a lot of Belgian and French expats who would come on vacation and they'd bring their children. And they weren't allowed to be in the forest with their children, but I think they would maybe tip the guides and they would get, and then they'd be in the forest and I'd be sitting with them and the chimps would arrive and the chimps would give food calls when they saw the children. <laughs> 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 and the Belgians would say, oh, it's so adorable, what are they saying? <laughs> They're thinking they want to eat your kid, actually. So, so yeah, so the answer is that, that, but that was a rare instance. That was a very rare instance. There are incidents, as you could Google this, of chimps going into villages and taking children out of homes. Yeah, because they're, they're predators. We don't like to think of them that way, but they are predators also. Thank you. Please join me again. We have a, a gift for you on behalf of all the staff. Thank you again. Thank you.